years. He has, uh, uh, I wouldn't say he retired from local work, but he quit doing local work and went into doing uh, meeting work. And so he travels all over the country doing lectureships, doing uh, gospel meetings, encampments. Uh, anywhere a person wants, uh, anyone who asks him to come and speak, uh, he is just so excited about doing so. And uh, Keith, he loves the Word of God, and he loves Christians, and he wants to see the church become strong. He wants to be a part of reviving it and making it everything that God would have it to be. Uh, Keith Parker is just one who does it so well. So we're blessed to have him here this morning with him as he, as he talks to us about, you know, having a better hope. Brother Keith. Did you see me on TV? <laughs> Did you see me on the game show, The Price is Right? For 16 and a half years, I preached at the Hendersonville Church of Christ, Hendersonville, Tennessee, just outside of Nashville, home of Johnny Cash. And uh, for the last uh, eight and a half years, I've been traveling all across America. And uh, some time ago, I was preaching out in California. And one day, we decided to go down to Hollywood to the game show, The Price is Right. And I was sitting there in the audience, and all of a sudden, I heard my name, Alan Parker. Alan's my first name. By the way, a few minutes ago, I met a guy in the audience, Keith. Keith, raise your hand. His name is Keith Allen. My name is Alan Keith. Great. I was sitting there in the audience, and all of a sudden, I heard my name, Alan Parker. Alan's my first name. Alan Parker, come on down. And I went on down. Did you guys see me on the game show, The Price is Right? I was on that thing. Not only did I get on the show, I got on the stage because I won the bid. Uh, not only did I get on the stage, I got into the showcase because I did the wheel. Uh, ladies, you know what I'm talking about. I did that wheel. It landed on a dollar. That got me $1,000 that put me into the showcase, folks. Not only did I get into the showcase, I won the showcase. On the game show, the price is right. I won the showcase. I really did. Is there anybody in this audience that needs a snowmobile? <laughs> yeah, with the snow that you had last winter, right? Uh, some of you do. That's what I want. I want a snowmobile and a jet ski, a wave runner. I want a trip to Canada. I want a trip to Maui. Yeah. I want a lawnmower and a weed eater and a blower. It was about a, it was about a $33,000 day. Pretty good year and a day, wouldn't you say? And that was a big deal for me. It was a big deal to be out in California preaching for that church. It was a big deal to be on the game show, The Price is Right. Let me tell you what's a big deal. It's a big deal to be in the state of Idaho. It's a big deal to preach where Richard preaches every Sunday. Uh, Richard, Clint, others have planted a lot of seed. And we've been here for a few days to put a little water on that seed and God will give the increase. But what an honor, what a, what a blessing to be with you and thank you for the invitation. Now, I've got to ask you folks, how many song leaders do you have? <laughs> I mean, we've had, we've had lots and lots of services this week and Lots and lots of song leaders, and they've all done a good job. Brandon did a good job this morning. And, and you know, you always need to brag on these song leaders. Don't ever up this, uh, upset the song leader. <laughs> uh, maybe you heard about, the, did you hear about the preacher and the song leader that were not getting along? They were fussing and fighting. And it began to spill over into the Sunday assemblies. One Sunday morning, the preacher got up and he preached on commitment, 100% commitment. And after the sermon, the song leader led the song, I shall not be moved. <laughs> well, the next Sunday, the preacher got up and preached on gossip, how we ought to be very careful about the use of our tongues. And after the sermon, the song leader led the song, I love to tell the story. <laughs> well, the next Sunday, the preacher got up and preached on giving, how we ought to liberally give to the work of the church. And after the sermon, the song leader led the song, Jesus paid it all. <laughs> the next Sunday, the preacher got up and preached on alcohol. He said, now, brothers and sisters, if I had all the whiskey in the world, I would take it and I would throw it into the river. And would you believe the song leader led the song, shall we gather at the river? <laughs> Well, as you can imagine, that upset the preacher, made the preacher mad. And the next Sunday, he got up and he told his church that he was thinking about quitting, resigning, going somewhere else to preach. And the song leader led the song, Oh, Why Not Tonight? 
Well, as you can imagine, the preacher quit. He resigned. And the last Sunday he was there. He got up and he said, Now, brothers and sisters, it's Jesus who's brought me here and it's Jesus who's taken me away. And with a big old smile on his face, the song leader led the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. <laughs> so, so you never want to upset these song leaders, brag on these song leaders. And this is a, not only a warm church, a friendly church, but this is a very gifted, very talented church. And again, from uh, our hearts, the speaker's hearts, to you, thank you for the invitation this weekend. Several years ago, I was studying the Bible in a Bible class with some students. I had 85 students in this Bible class. And I asked this question. I said, if Jesus were to come right now, or if you were to die, would you go to A, heaven, B, hell, C, I do not know, or D, neither heaven or hell? Guess what the number one answer was? Yeah, see, I, I, I don't know. Three in that Bible class of 85 students, most of whom members of Churches of Christ said, uh, neither heaven or hell. I, I would not go to heaven, I would not go to hell. Frankly, I do not understand that answer, but three said neither heaven or hell. Eleven said, I'm lost, I, I, I don't have any hope, I, I, I'm going to hell. 31 said, praise God, I'm going to heaven. But 40 of them, 4-0, four 40 of them said, uh, I don't know. Well, I want to start by asking you the very same question this morning. If you were to die right now, or if Jesus were to come, and wouldn't it be wonderful if Jesus came today? You, you sang it a few minutes ago. A Lord come quickly. Well, if Jesus were to come today, would you go to A, heaven, B, hell, C, I do not know, or D, neither heaven or hell. Let me be honest with you. Let me tell you what some of you are thinking, okay? I'm not sure. I don't know. You, you know, I want to be saved. I want to go to heaven, but I just don't know. And maybe it's the devil that's placed those doubts in your heart, and maybe you've lived in a way that you have a reason to doubt. And we don't want you to leave this morning with doubts. We don't want you to leave in despair or in discouragement. We want you to leave with hope. And that's what we're going to be talking about for a few minutes this morning. I want you to take a Bible and go with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 7. It's a great book. Right before the book of James is Hebrews, is Hebrews chapter 7. And focus in on verse 19. They've asked me to mention, talk about verse 19. For the law, the law of Moses, made nothing complete or perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh. By this hope we draw close, we draw nigh unto God. There's a word that's mentioned here in Hebrews chapter 7 that I want you to notice. And of course the word that I'm talking about is this one. It's the word hope. Hope. Do you have hope? Do you have hope? Look back to chapter 6. It's mentioned not only in chapter 7 and verse 19. It's mentioned in chapter 6 and verse 19. Verse 19 of chapter 7 and verse 19 of chapter 6. Concerning this hope, the writer said, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. The word hope carries with it two ideas. You need to understand this. First of all, it carries with it the idea of desire. If you hope for something, you want it. You really, really want it. You desire it. It also carries with it the idea of expectation. You not only want it, you really expect it. Let me illustrate what I'm talking about. You probably would never ever say, I hope to get sick. Is there anybody in this audience that hopes to get sick? Uh, you, you would not say, I hope to get sick, because you don't want to get sick, right? Now, you might expect to get sick. Uh, there may be some sick people in your family. You may have come in contact with some sick people. But you would not say, I, I hope to get sick, because you don't want to get sick. You probably would not ever say, I hope to get fired. Do you hope to get fired? Uh, you may have messed up at work. <laughs> uh, you know, the boss may have been looking at the wrong time. You may expect to get fired, but you don't want to get fired. On the other hand, you probably would never ever say, I hope to be a billionaire. Do you hope to be a billionaire? Well, you might want that. You might want that. Uh, but you probably down deep don't expect that. 
Uh, you probably would never ever say, uh, I hope to go to the moon. Uh, you might want to go to the moon. You might, you might want to be an astronaut, but you probably down deep don't expect to go to the moon. It's desire coupled with expectation. You really, really want it, but you also really, really expect it. Now, I know you want to be saved. You want to go to heaven. I mean, you would not be in church on a Sunday morning unless you really wanted to go to heaven. But honestly, honestly, by God's grace, do you expect to go to heaven? Do you have hope? Well, what I want to do this morning, I want to share with you some reasons why we can leave with a smile on our faces and a song and our hearts and a leap and our steps. I want to share with you at least three reasons why God's people can have hope. In the first place, you have a father. A father. You're in Hebrews chapter 6. Go back to verse 10. Check out verse 10. For God... God the Father. What kind of Father? Well, He's not unjust. He's not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. God knows what you've been doing. God knows your heart. He knows your ministry, which you have shown toward His name in that you have ministered or served the saints and you keep on serving. How many baptized believers do we have in this audience? If you believe in Christ and you have put on Jesus in baptism, be proud of it. Look around, folks. That's most of us. I have some good news for you. I have some good news. You have a father that's crazy about you. He loves you. You, you say, Keith, my, my father abused me when I was a kid. I'm not talking about your father. You, you say, my father, a good father, while well, he ran off with another woman, left mom to struggle with his kids. I'm not talking about your father. I'm talking about your father. You have a father that loves you. I, I, I want to I share something with you that literally changed my life. It, it literally changed my life. It's a very simple thought. But when this thought occurred to me many, many years ago, it changed my direction. It changed my mood. It changed my life. And, and it's a very simple thought. And the thought is this. My father... Now, I lost my father, my daddy, four and a half years ago. I miss him every day. If your daddy is still living, do yourself a favor. Go out of your way to tell him, Dad, I love you. I wish that my father, an elder of the church, I wish that my, fa my father was still here so that I could say, Dad, I love you. But I'm not talking about my father. I'm talking about my father. My father is so good. He wants me to go to heaven even more than I want myself to go to heaven. Let, let, let me say it like this. Your father, your father is so good, he wants you to be saved even more than you want yourself to be saved. Do you want to be saved? You just missed a wonderful time to say amen. So I'll give you another shot, okay? <laughs> you want to be saved? Amen. amen. Go to heaven? You say, go to heaven more than life. Sure, I want to go to heaven. See, that's a great desire. But no matter how fired up you become, no matter how strong your desire is to go to heaven, you can read and study your Bible every day. You can get down on your knees and pray 17 times a day. You can get out here and knock on doors and set up Bible studies and talk to your neighbors and friends about heaven and about Jesus. But I'm telling you folks, no matter how strong your desire is to go to heaven, no matter how fired up you become, there's a God in heaven who, who loves you. He's crazy about you. And He wants you to be saved even more than you want yourself to be saved. And that's the goodness of God, and that's good news preaching the goodness of God. Let me ask the fathers, the daddies of this audience, daddies, do you want your own kids to go to heaven? I have three kids. I have three kids. I have four grandbabies. You think I want my children to go to heaven? More than life. More than life. Sure, I want my kids to go to heaven. And you know, if I want that for my kids, don't you know the Heavenly Father wants that for His kids? See, God is not against you. He's for you. And if God be for you, who can be against you? Romans 8 and verse 31. I'm telling you, you can leave today with hope, a smile on your face and a song in your heart, a leap in your step. Because number one, you've got a Father, a God that knows who you are, knows your ministry, your service, knows your heart. You have a father who is crazy 
about you. Let me give you the second reason why you can leave today with hope in the second place. You have a Lord that lifts you. Number one, a Father that loves you. And number two, a Lord that lifts you. Jesus Himself said, If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. John 12 and verse 32. You're in Hebrews chapter 6. I want you to check out the last verse. The last verse. Who do you see in verse 20 of Hebrews 6? What name? You see a, a, a long name by the name of Melchizedek. But what about before Melchizedek? Jesus, the forerunner. You see that? The high priest. You have a Lord that lifts you. I want you to imagine. Imagine, if you will, in just a few minutes when we stand and sing the invitation song, somebody steps out into this aisle and he comes down to the front and he says, you know, Jesus Christ is Lord. And he says, I, I, I want to be a Christian. I, I want to be baptized. So he goes back to one of these rooms. He changes clothes. He goes down into this baptistry. And Brother Richard says something like, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins. And he pushes this guy into the water and he brings him up. Question. Is he saved or lost? No doubt about it, right? I mean, sincerely from the heart, he believes in Jesus. He, he, he makes that good confession, Jesus Christ is Lord, Romans 10, 9 and 10. He, he's willing to change his life. We call that repentance, Acts 17, 30. God commands all people everywhere to change, to repent. And, and from the heart, he sincerely is buried in water for the forgiveness of sins. He comes up out of the water. And let's say maybe uh, he trips and he falls and he breaks his neck. He dies. He has a heart attack two seconds after he's baptized. Audience, is he saved or lost? No doubt about it. Jesus said anybody that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. What if he doesn't die? What if he continues to live for 20 or 30, 30 years? For 20 or 30 years, he's faithful, not perfect, but he's faithful to Jesus. For 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years, he serves the Lord as a Christian, and then he dies. You know what some of us have come to believe? Some of us have come to believe that no longer can he be sure of his salvation. No longer can he know that he's going to heaven. And brethren, by implication... We have said that the new babe, the new Christian, the newborn babe has more assurance than, than the child of God that lives for Jesus for 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years. And by implication, we have said that the longer you live for Jesus, the less assurance you have. And by implication, we have come to believe once saved, never saved. You know, in churches of Christ, we have fought against the doctrine, once saved, always saved, to the point that I think maybe we've gone to the other extreme, once saved, never saved. Sir, are you saved? Well, I don't know. I want to be saved, but I just don't know. Uh, Ma'am, are you going to heaven? Well, you know, I, I'm not sure. And, and see, ladies and gentlemen, the, the Bible does not teach once saved, always saved. It doesn't teach that. But neither does Scripture teach once saved, never saved. What the Bible teaches is once saved, now saved. Romans 8 and verse 1, There is now no condemnation to them that are in Jesus Christ. And didn't John say in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of Jesus Christ that you may know, not think, that you may know, not suspect, that you may know, not guess, that you may know you have eternal life. There are a lot of things that I do not know. But let me tell you something that I do know. I know that my Redeemer lives and I know that I live in my Redeemer. And so you can know that too. You can know that too. Because the same blood that washed away my sins when I was baptized into Christ just keeps on washing away my sins 
as long as I'm walking in the light. You remember 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, if we, we as God's people, we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of the Lord, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. Maybe your Bible says purifies us. It's present tense. It just keeps on cleansing, keeps on purifying us from sin. Let me tell you what that means in a very practical, practical sense, okay? The child of God, the faithful, not perfect, but the faithful child of God is always saved. He's not saved one moment and lost the next moment. He's not under the blood of Jesus one second and out of the blood of Jesus the next second. The faithful child of God is always saved. He's saved seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days out of the year, as long as he's walking in the light with God, toward God, in God's direction. You say, wait a minute, can a child of God be lost? Absolutely a child of God can be lost. But John says if we walk in the light, as he's in the light, we do have communion with each other, and that blood just constantly keeps us clean. I'm telling you folks, you can leave this morning with hope. You don't have to leave in despair. You don't have to leave in discouragement. You can leave in hope. Because number one, you have a Father that loves you. And number two, a Lord that lives you. Number three, you ready for the third reason? Reason number three, you have a spirit, a spirit, a Holy Spirit that lives in you. You're in Hebrews chapter 6. Glance back to verse 4. Who do you see in verse 4? The writer is talking about Christians. Christians were made partakers of the who? Audience. Do you see that? My Bible says Holy Ghost. Maybe your Bible says Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. As God's people, we are made partakers of the Holy Spirit. So number one, a Father that loves you. Number two, a Jesus, a Lord that lives you. And number three, a Spirit that lives in you. Everybody look up here. Everybody look. You see this body? This six foot three, 200 and <clears throat> pound body. You know who lives in this body? Not only do I live in this body, the, the Spirit of Keith lives in this body, but the Holy Spirit lives in this body. You say, Keith, how do you know that? The Bible tells me so. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? If you're a baptized believer, when you were baptized, three wonderful things happened to you. Number one, your sins were washed away by the blood of Jesus. Number two, you were added to the family of God. We call the family of God the, the church. Acts 2, 47. God added to the saved, those who were being saved. He added to the number, the church, those who were being saved. And then number three, when you were baptized, not only were your sins washed away and you were given a very special gift, the gift of the cleansing, remission of sins that added to the church, but you were also given a very special gift in the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.38 didn't the Apostle Peter preach? We often leave this part out. But didn't Peter preach, repent and be baptized to every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness, the remission of sins? And we often stop there. It's not the end of the verse. He goes on to say, and you'll receive what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. You say, uh, Keith, what's the gift of the Holy Spirit? I don't understand. What's the gift of the Holy Spirit? Let me illustrate like this. Uh, blue shirt. What's your name? Zach? Zach? Keith Allen, Allen Zach, Zach something. <laughs> Zach, how old are you? 25. I've got a gift for you, my gift to you. It's a gift of a $5 bill. Say it again. Put that in the collection plate. <laughs> a col the collection plate? No, my gift to you. My gift to you. Uh, he, he's, he wanted me to put that in the collection plate. He's shocked that a preacher would give away money, right? <laughs> he's never seen a preacher give away money in his life. A gift of a dollar bill is a dollar bill. A gift of a five dollar bill is a five dollar bill. A gift of a twenty dollar bill, that would have been better, right, Zach? Twenty dollar bill. A gift of a twenty dollar bill is a twenty dollar bill. And it seems to me that the gift of the Holy Spirit is the uh, Holy Spirit. 
that God gives to all them that obey him, Acts 5, verse 32. And, and everywhere I go, I go to the bank, the Holy Spirit goes with me. I go to the grocery store, the Holy Spirit goes with me. I come to church, the Spirit comes with me. See, the Holy Spirit lives in me and he prays for me, he intercedes for me, he strengthens me. Read Romans chapter 8. I, I tell you folks, you can leave to, today with a smile on your face and a song in your heart, a leap in your step. Because you not only have a Father that loves you and a Lord that lifts you, but you have a Spirit that lives within you. Now, I have three questions. We're about ready to sing the invitation song. Don't reach for your songbook. Just listen to me, okay? I'm asking you, when I ask these three, three questions, I'm not asking the person sitting beside you or in front of you, behind you. It's just me and you, one-on-one. Here's question number one. I'm asking you, do you have a father? I'm not asking, is your daddy still living? I, I, I'm asking, do you have a father? Can you honestly close your eyes, bow your head, and say, Abba, Father, is God your father? Scripture says we're all the children of God by faith, for as many of us as have been baptized into Christ, we have put on Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Have you put on Christ? We have some people in this audience. You did not raise your hand a few minutes ago. Uh, you did not uh, raise your hand to say, I'm a baptized believer. You need to be baptized into Christ. I'm asking, is God your Father? Question number one. You ready for number two? Question number two. It's a very simple question. Just me and you. I'm, I'm talking to you. Is Jesus your Lord? Is He your Lord? Jesus said, why do you call me Lord? And do not the things that I say, Luke 6, 46. Uh, Jesus said, Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter, but he that is doing the will of my Father which is in heaven. I'm asking, is Jesus your Lord? Are you doing the will of the Father who's in heaven? Is He your Lord? Question number three. Does the Holy Spirit live in you? Everywhere you go, the Spirit of God goes with you. Have you received the gift of the Holy Spirit? speaking to about 600 young people and I asked them this question, are you saved? About 246 of them, that's about 40 plus percent. Most of them were members of Churches of Christ of these 600 young people, but 246 of them said, I don't know. I, I want to close by asking you the very same question. Do you have hope? Are you saved? You want to go to heaven? Do you expect to go to heaven? Are you saved? Let me tell you what some of you, again, are thinking. You're thinking, well, I'm not sure. I just don't know. We don't want you to leave with doubts. We don't want you to leave in discouragement. We don't want you to leave with, with despair. We want you to leave with hope. Because you do have a Father that, that loves you, a Lord that lifts you, and a Spirit that lives within you. Or maybe you don't have a Spirit that lives within you because you've never been baptized. We have some people in this audience that do need to be baptized into Christ. You've been thinking about it. You've been, you've been talking about it. You've been saying, you know, one day I'll become a Christian. I, I would say to you what Ananias said to Saul. Why do you wait? What are you waiting for? Get up, uh, young man, young lady, sir, ma'am. Get up, be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts twenty two sixteen. 16. We do have some people who need to be baptized. You say, Keith, you're not talking to me. I raised my hand a few minutes ago. Oh, you raised your hand? Yeah, I've been baptized. I, I was baptized back in the 1960s. Oh, you're a baptized believer. I'm glad you're a baptized believer. Could I be honest with you? We have some baptized believers in this audience. And, and you're thinking, you know, I, I want to go to heaven, but I'm, I'm just not sure. And the devil has put those doubts in your heart, and maybe you've lived in a way that you have a reason to doubt. Uh, your faith needs to be renewed. You need to be prayed for is there anybody in this audience that needs to be prayed for? I, I don't know what you've been praying. Let me tell you what I've been praying. I've been praying as we sing the invitation song today that somebody, somebody in this audience will come and say, uh, pray for me. I, I just need to be prayed for. And, and when one comes, maybe there's another, maybe another. Pray for me. Is there anybody in this audience that needs to be prayed for?
1 Thessalonians 5, 17. All of us know that verse. Three words. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray without ceasing. Does anybody know 1 Thessalonians 5, 25? Same verse. Same chapter. A few verses later. It has four words. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 has three words. Pray without ceasing. We all know that verse, right? Does anybody know 1 Thessalonians 5, 25? It has four words. Here they are. Brethren, pray for us. Who said that? Wait a minute. Did somebody say Paul? The, 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 the Apostle Paul? Paul said, brethren, pray for us. I read that and I think, wow. If Paul, the Apostle Paul, needed to be prayed for, what about me? What about you? Is there anybody in this audience that needs to come and say, as did Paul, pray for me? Pray for us. Satan will do everything that he can to stop you. But Jesus died to call you. Will you surrender to the call? Would you claim your hope? You need to be baptized? Come on. You need to be prayed for, my brother, my sister. Don't leave today thinking, you know, I I should have responded. Why don't you lead the way? And who knows, if you come, I'm convinced others will come too. You need hope? Come today. Why don't you lead the way? Let's stand and sing.